Welcome to today's program titled Workplace Religious Accommodations Under the New Substantial Increased Costs Standard Unanimous Supreme Court Decides Graf v. DeJoy. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down. It will not be reread, and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will also be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Lynn Kappelman. Lynn, you may begin. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Lynn Kappelman. I'm a partner in the Boston office of Seiforth Shaw. And I'm joined today, whoops, I'm joined today by my colleague, Don Soloway, who's also a partner at Seiforth Shaw. Um, I lead our firm's trial practice group, uh, as well as our retail and pharmaceutical industry practice group. Don leads uh, our trial and appellate practice group uh, along with me. Uh, and Don and I have actually been studying religious uh, discrimination and accommodation issues pretty much together for about 25 years. We are delighted to be joined today by our colleague from the Houston office, Darianne Harris, who has spent uh, the last year uh, getting us up to speed on the latest and greatest in the religious accommodation battle. Um, and so we are so grateful that he's joining us today. Um, without further ado, I wanted to go over what uh, our agenda was today. We're going to talk a little bit about the Groff v. DeJoy decision from the, from the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and I'm going to start with a little religious accommodation two-minute primer just to set the table for us. We're going to talk about the precedent-setting case TWA versus Hardison and how the de minimis test came about for employers to determine whether and when they had to grant a religious accommodation for an employee. Then we're going to get to the, de Groy v, the Groff v. DeJoy decision and talk about uh, what happened and what was argued. And then we're going to talk about what's changed and what hasn't changed as a result of Groff v. DeJoy. Finally, we're going to hopefully give you some key takeaways and practical guidance and talk a little bit about how we apply the new substantial costs test in our business. Before I go on, though, I wanted to say for those of you who have been reading articles uh, post Groff v. DeJoy, and listening to uh, media coverage, I'm sure you've read that there's been a seismic shift uh, in the way that employers are supposed to look at these issues um, and that everything has changed. Um, in fact, what I would argue to you, uh, and I think Don would agree, that for those of us studying this for 20, 25 years, it really is a lot more nuanced than that. And I think that the de minimis test has been eroding somewhat for the last 25 years. And we saw a lot of foreshadowing, a lot of cases that suggested to us that the de minimis test was no longer really a test where you employers could just deny religious accommodation requests without much thought. So hopefully by the end of our presentation today, you'll agree with the three of us that although Groff v. DeJoy is an important change and one that we need to be mindful of, it wasn't a seismic shift in the way that the law is being applied. Let's just talk a little bit and set the table about where this all comes from. Under Title VII, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and many state analogs, if an employee advises his or her employer that he or she has a sincere religious belief, and that belief conflicts with a job requirement, the employer has been required to engage in the interactive process, talk to the employee, explore reasonable accommodations, and either provide a reasonable accommodation or be able to show that it cannot do so without undue hardship to its business. And so um, over the years, the whole issue of reasonable accommodation has developed and the whole question of what constitutes undue hardship to a business has developed. Now, you may be aware um, that there's also a test under the ADA. And if a person is, uh, has a disability and they request an accommodation, the standard is much higher. They must really, an employer must really show that it's going to cost the employer a lot of money in order to say, I'm not going to try to grant you 
your accommodation. But the interesting thing here is that under the TWA Hardison case, they created a quite a different standard for a religious accommodation than that which exists for a disability accommodation. And employers, frankly, have relied on that. So in 1977, Hardison was a case um, that concerned the proper interpretation and application of Title VII, specifically in this religious accommodation area. Uh, as we know, uh, Title VII prohibits discrimination against any individual with respect to compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment due to that individual's religious beliefs, unless an employer demonstrates that it's unable to accommodate the religious belief without causing undue hardship to the employer's business. Now that language is not too dissimilar to the ADA, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act language, and Title VII never defined undue hardship. So it wasn't until Hardison in 1977 when we got some guidelines about what this means for an employer in the religious accommodation sense. And what Hardison said was that an accommodation creates an undue hardship in the religious accommodation world if it causes, quote, more than a de minimis burden on the employer's business. De minimis meaning the barest minimum. If it's more than the barest minimum burden, you don't have to grant that religious accommodation. There was a little noticed footnote in Hardison, ladies and gentlemen, that also referred to substantial additional costs and said you have to determine whether it causes substantial additional costs. Ironically, Hardison was dealing with uh, an individual's seniority rights under a collective bargaining agreement. So it was in a union atmosphere that this case was determined. But as happens sometimes, employers grabbed the de minimis standard and ran with it, and courts ran with it. And employers have long relied on the de minimis standard in the religious accommodation context. Um, it is different from the ADA's undue uh, hardship standard, which requires significant difficulty or expense. But I will say that Dawn and I have long advised employers, even under the de minimis standard, and after TWA Hardison, that the employer still has a burden to prove undue hardship of some kind. The employer has to show an agency or the judge or even a jury if you go to trial that the requested accommodation imposed some sort of an undue hardship, even if it was less of a hardship uh, than the ADA context. And I bring up this case, Claudia v. Costco, because it was my case in the First Circuit in 2004. And it was the case that, that is oft cited prior to Groff v. DeJoy because it really did not require that the that the employers show a lot of costs in order to say, I'm denying your request for accommodation. So Kim Claudier was a plaintiff and she alleged that her employer Costco Wholesale failed to offer her a reasonable accommodation when she said she had a conflict between the no facial jewelry provision of Costco's dress code and her religious practice as a member of something called the Church of Body Modification. Court held uh, that Costco had a legitimate interest in presenting a workforce to its customers that is, in Costco's eyes, reasonably professional in appearance. And Costco's dress code included in the handbook, distributed to all employees, furthered that interest. And so the court in the First Circuit in 2004 said, it's axiomatic that for better or worse, employees reflect on their employers. It's particularly true of employees who regularly interact with customers, as Claudia did in her cashier position. And even if Claudia did not personally receive any complaints about her appearance, her facial jewelry influenced Costco's public image. In Costco's calculation, it detracted from its professionalism. So they, they said in the First Circuit, we hold that Costco has no duty to accommodate Claudia because it could not do so without undue hardship. So that's a perfect example of the de minimis standard um, saying the employer really doesn't have to show much, doesn't even have to show one additional penny that it would spend to accommodate this employee in order to deny the request. However, there are many circuits and many states uh, with their own state analogs since 2004 that have started to look closely at this issue and erode that a bit. For example, in the Baker v. Home Depot case, a case not too dissimilar from Groff, the employee's religious beliefs prohibited uh, him working on Sunday. And for nearly a year, 
his supervisors agreed not to schedule him until a new manager insisted that working on Sundays was mandatory. So a manager offered him part-time employment and said, you can have Sundays off. But the employee declined because it would reduce his pay and disqualify him for benefits. Manager also offered him a later shift on Sundays so the employee could attend church in the mornings. Employee declined because he believed Sunday work was prohibited entirely, not just for part of the day. Manager allowed and offered the employee to switch shifts with coworkers, which the employee allegedly rejected. Now, this is a lot more already, right? Five, six years later that Home Depot is trying to do to accommodate this employee. Um, the district court ruled that Home Depot's offer to work in the afternoons or evenings on Sunday was probably a reasonable accommodation. But the Second Circuit vacated the judgment and said the employer offered an accommodation for only one of the employee's two religious objections. And they said, we're going to remand this on the issue of whether Home Depot's offer of part-time employment uh, to exchange shifts is in fact a reasonable accommodation because the employee would still have to work on Sundays and he believed he shouldn't have to work at all. So you can see already in 2006, some circuits are questioning this de minimis standard and asking how far really does the employer have to go to try to accommodate? Maybe a little bit further than the first circuit thought in Claudia v. Costco. Um, again, in Mass Bay Transportation Authority in 2008, a little bit later, the court held under the Massachusetts statute, although there's no obligation to undertake an interactive process if the employer can conclusively show that all conceivable accommodations would impose an undue hardship, but this employer didn't show undue hardship because it didn't even attempt a good faith effort to accommodate the employee's Sabbath observance. Again, this puts the onus on the employer to try to accommodate the employee's Sabbath observance. And so there was emphasis on the conduct of the employer's business and the size of the business and the context of what this employee did for the business and how hard it would be to accommodate the employee's Sabbath observance. And so the mass statute Massachusetts has its own statute that offers four non-exhaustive examples of what would be undue hardship. If the employer was unable to provide services which were required by federal or state law, if the accommodation would unduly compromise public health or safety, and I want you to pay attention to that because that's a theme we're gonna come back to later. If the employee's presence is indispensable, if you could show it was indispensable to the orderly transaction of the business, and frankly, how many retails can show that, that a cashier or frankly, anybody that works there is indispensable or the employee's presence is needed to alleviate an emergency situation. I think you'll agree with me that that's a pretty high bar for undue hardship, much higher than we thought de minimis meant. And this is in 2008. So what are the kinds of things that we're seeing from employers when they're asking us about how to, you know, think about this de minimis test. Again, we talked about the Sabbath observance, with, which comes up all the time. Um, how can we accommodate someone's request to be off every Saturday or every Sunday? For example, in a retail establishment, like a Costco or a Home Depot or an Aldi, for example, um, it would be hard, right, to have somebody off every Sunday since, since weekends are sometimes the busiest retail days. Um, and quite frankly, in Baker v. Home Depot, they said that. They said, you have how many hundreds of people working at once? You can find someone to swap shifts with that person on Sundays. Uh, it wouldn't be too huge uh, of an expense. But I will say that Don and I had a trial in Pittsburgh for Aldi um, where uh, one of the uh, employees wanted every sing single Sunday off. And because context matters, Aldi only employed three people in the store on any one, at any one time in a sort of a small shop. And we could show that it really would have been a burden on the other employees. And we would have had to pay someone overtime. And the jury at least thought that was enough to constitute an undue hardship and found for Aldi in that instance. Whether a judge would have found for Aldi, for example, in the second circuit, 
or in some of these other circuits, I can't say for sure, but at least a jury was convinced. We often find um, employers asking us, what should I do about this particular employee who wants to take five prayer breaks and face east in the middle of the day? Um, and, and what we say is, and what we have always said and will probably still say is, what does the employee do? How will his or her absence affect the, the conduct of the business, the functioning of the business? Are you able to accommodate this employee without affecting the rest of the business? Um, for example, is that employee on a manufacturing line? If they walk out in the middle of the process to take prayer breaks, will that shut down the line? Will that affect the other five people on the line after him or her and affect their productivity? Then it might be a harder thing to accommodate. If the person is in a white collar job and he or she can just get up from his or her desk and go pray for 10 minutes, come back, finish his or her work, then the context matters. And maybe that would not be a substantial cost. Um, and then finally, we often see questions about religious dress in the workplace. Um, and sometimes this will um, either um, conflict with a dress code or it will conflict, conflict with some sort of um, a policy that people have about headdresses. Uh, and again, if it is a, sale, a, a safety or a health issue, sometimes that will cause more than a de minimis cost, even prior to Groff uh, case and even after Groff. Um, but if, in fact, it is just to wear a white uniform for a year after baptism because their, their religion of Santeria requires it, maybe you can accommodate them by making their uniform that they have to wear all the time white so that they can comply with your dress code and their own policy. I remember a case for one retailer where a woman wanted to wear a burqa, but the retailer had a dress code. Their colors were blue and yellow. And this particular retailer went, aha, I can make a blue and yellow burqa and this person can wear their burqa, but also still uh, comply with our dress code. So even before Groff, that was something that we suggested people do. And it's something we will continue to suggest people do in reaction to these requests that really aren't costly and aren't burdensome uh, to do. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Darianne, because I think what he'll tell you is that we have known that this was coming, this, this Groff rewriting of the standard for a while. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Darianne? Exactly. Um, if we take a look at some of the decisions from the Supreme Court, including the decision in which Hardison, including Hardison itself, if you look at the dissent from Justice Thurgood Marshall, he, he wrote a pretty pointed dissent in which he derided the Hardison opinion and said uh, that it dealt a fatal blow to all efforts under Title VII to accommodate work requirements to religious practices. If we fast forward up to 2020 in a case uh, called Patterson v. Walgreens, we see that Justice Alito hinted that this decision was going to be over, they're going to be reconsidering it soon, but didn't appreciate the, the case that was before him to say that it was a proper vehicle to do so. Um, and in Small versus Memphis Light, we, we find Justice Gorsuch saying um, that the majority's refusal to hear another religious discrimination case that, that could have put Hardison on the chopping block, um, or actually the exact quote is that it was past time for the court to correct Hardison, um, suggesting that Hardison was going to be overturned soon. And we also have another instance, um, and for coming from the 11th Circuit, from a Florida district court case uh, in which uh, the employee disclosed his Friday to Saturday Sabbath observance after accepting the position. After disclosure, the offer for employment was rescinded. The district court applying Hardison ruled in favor of the employer. And the employee argued that the employer could have shifted other uh, employees' works schedules and duties to accommodate his religious observance. Interestingly, he conceded that an accommodation would cause more of more than a de minimis cost, uh, and he moved for summary affirmance so that he could petition the uh, United States Supreme Court to overturn Hardison, and that writ of, of cert was denied. So we see this push towards, um, particularly as the makeup of the court had developed in, in which 
it was a it would seem to be favorable that Hardison would be overturned in favor of more religious protections that many many people were sort of itching to sort of get this case to be reconsidered and so to give some background on uh, Groff v. DeJoy, um, Gerald Groff was a carrier for the for the Postal Service, and his religious beliefs prohibited him from working on Sunday. When he refused to work on Sunday, the Postal Service disciplined him, and eventually it prompted him to just resign his employment. Um, he then sued the, po the Postal Service, saying that they violated Title VII by failing to reasonably accommodate his religion. The district court actually ruled in favor of the Postal Service applying Hardison and the Third Circuit affirmed relying on Hardison again. And uh, this instance, the Supreme Court granted Groff the petition to review Hardison. And this is the case that we're discussing today. So the key issues in Groff uh, can be boiled down to two, two issues that were before the court. And the, the, the main issue, the first issue is, sh should the court change the de minimis test for undue hardship under Title VII, as stated in Hardison, and whether the undue hardship uh, inquiry can take into consideration the burden that an employee's religious accommodations would have on its coworkers, um, rather than the conduct of the business itself, which is a nuanced distinction. So oral argument for this for for these uh, for this case was was held on April 18th, and during oral argument, the court tried to find common ground between both of the parties because interestingly, neither party really defended the de minimis standard, um, and so the the court was expressing skepticism on si simply switching from Title VII to applying the ADA standard of significant difficulty or expense. Uh, the justices debated how much to weigh the accommodations effect on employee morale and if we take a closer look at the way that each party uh, characterized their their arguments we'll find that the petitioner Groff he wanted to replace the, the de minimis standard with the ADA significant difficulty or, or expense test um, and he emphasized a critique of the court's prior interpretation of what it means to impose an undue hardship saying that it violated the promise that employees should not be forced to choose between their faith and their job and made a mockery of the English language on the grounds that it cannot be squared with the term undue hardship. If we look at the government's arguments, they wanted to not overturn the, 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 minimum, the, undue, the undue hardship um, standard, but just to clarify that it offered substantial protection for religious observance. Um, the government also emphasized that Hardison had reference not only to de minimis costs, but also in a little notice footnote, substantial costs. And there was a large emphasis on history saying that, you know, this case has been nearly 50 years old. So many lower courts had, had not only relied on Hardison, but also sort of acknowledged that it should be affording greater protection for religious observance then the de minimis language might suggest if you read that in isolation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Don to get into the nuances of the opinion itself. Thank you, Darian. Um, so Groff is a unanimous opinion, um, and that's something that you might not know if you were just reading the media headlines, because I think it's been, been widely presented as kind of a right-wing decision, but it's in fact a nine to zero decision written by Justice Alito. Um, and so um, the, oops, go back there. Um, so the, on the first issue that Darian mentioned, um, the court clarified the undue hardship standard, um, and they were careful to say that they were not overruling Hardison. In fact, they were clarifying Hardison. And so the new standard, instead of de minimis, is that the employer must show that the burden of granting an accommodation would result in substantial increased costs in relation to the conduct of its particular business. And you'll notice that that substantial increased cost is um, a term that is kind of buried in a footnote um, that had been little noticed in the Hardison decision itself. And the court really did kind of a plain meaning reading of, of Title VII's text um, and interpreted the ordinary meaning of hardship to be something that's hard to bear, 
um, and noted that the modifier undo meant that the burden has to rise to an excessive or unjustifiable level. And by contrast, the court looked at the plain meaning of the term de minimis um, as meaning very small or trifling. And basically the court said it can't be the case that you could deny a religious accommodation over just a trifling cost. Um, so that's, that's the first issue. Um, and uh, we, we wanted to draw out this quote because it's an important one. The court said, what is most important is that undue hardship in Title VII means what it says and courts should resolve whether a hardship would be substantial in the context of an employer's business in the common sense manner that it would use in applying such a test. So it's really kind of saying, we're gonna go back to um, the plain meaning of the terms undue hardship and, and also emphasize something that had been true even under Hardison, which is that you have to look at the request in the context of that particular employer's business. Um, and, uh, you know, context is really everything. And this is something we say to clients every day when we're helping them process these requests, um, is that you have to look at the particular accommodation at issue and the practical impact in light of the nature, size, and operating cost of the employer. And so it really is a case by case determination. That's always been true. Um, and, and the court reemphasized that point in Groff. Um, the court specifically addressed uh, the issues of overtime and shift swaps, which are um, issues that come up frequently in religious accommodation cases. Um, on the overtime point, the court said, faced with an accommodation request like Groff's, an employer must do more than conclude that forcing other employees to work overtime would constitute an undue hardship. Consideration of other options would also be necessary. So. Um, that's, that is a new point from the court that just the addition of overtime by itself is not going to meet this new substantial increased cost test. The court also specifically called out voluntary shift swapping as one option that is, quote, necessary to consider. And um, shift swaps are something that we have, have frequently advised clients to consider um, because it often can resolve um, Sabbath observance and, and other kinds of um, issues. And so the court was pointing us to the fact that that is going to be considered something, something that is necessary for employers to consider. And then on the second issue, um, the court addressed this issue of impact on coworkers. And this is something that comes up again and again. And I think it's actually helpful that the court has given us some, some more specific guidance as to how to think about impact on coworkers. Um, so what the court said is that impacts on coworkers are relevant only to the extent that those impacts go on to affect the conduct of the business. So, um, and, and went on to say that you have to analyze a further logical step. So not just that there is some impact to coworkers, but that impact in turn affects the conduct of the business. Um, there was a, although it was a unanimous decision, there was a concurrence by Sotomayor and Jackson, um, and they were, you know, agreed with the result, but were noting that in addition, some hardships such as the labor costs of coordinating voluntary shift swaps are not undue because they are too insubstantial. So we know where at least two of the justices um, stand on that additional um, feature of, of shift swapping. Um, and then said, nevertheless, if there's an undue hardship on the conduct of the employer's business, then such hardship is sufficient, even if it consists of hardship on employees. Um, so again, just two justices on those two points, but giving us a sense of, of kind of some of those backroom negotiations between the justices to arrive at a 9-0 result. Um, the court uh, majority opinion um, it, it made a specific point to say that it is not an undue hardship um, if a, a coworker just has animosity toward a particular religion or just religion in general or the very notion of religious accommodations. And it's important to realize that these have never been undue hardships. So um, we we have always advised clients that you know if. if the mere fact that a coworker doesn't like the idea that somebody gets Sundays off is not itself going to be sufficient to show an undue hardship. And so just, just to sort of emphasize the point, the impact on coworkers is now a two-part test. 
Um, and so again, I think that actually gives employers some structure in, in kind of thinking about coworker impact. So step one is, does it negatively impact coworkers at all? And step two is, does that negative impact actually affect the conduct of the business? And now I think Lynn is going to talk through the larger picture of what has changed with Groff and what has not changed. I think as I sort of um, alerted you to at the beginning of the webinar, I think that some things have changed and some things just simply have not changed in a seismic way. Um, the core process for considering undue hardship just really hasn't changed. Um, employer always had the burden to prove that there was a hardship to the agency judge or the jury. And the question was, you know, what was the undue hardship? Did it have to be something more than, uh, as, as Costco v. Cloudier defined it, you know, something that violated a dress code? Or did it have to be as much as, for example, Baker v. Home Depot defined it as, um, something that had to be significant cost that couldn't be borne? Um, employer always had to look at the particular request in light of the employer's operations. And I highlighted for you that a Sabbath request by someone who worked in a huge big box store of maybe 200 employees might be looked at differently than a Sabbath request by someone who worked in a shop which had three employees. And it might be diff more difficult to find a shift swap or coverage for that employee. I'm not saying that one doesn't get accommodated and one always does, but I'm saying context matters. Um, what the individual did and how others relied on that individual's work always also had to be considered. You had to look critically always at whether the impact on coworkers was sufficient to show undue hardship. Now, at least we've got some guardrails about what doesn't constitute undue hardship on coworkers and the kinds of things that won't be enough. And I think that is helpful, frankly. Um, Dawn didn't say this, but we always wondered in the case of shift swaps, does the employer say to the employee, yeah, sure, you can shift, you can swap shifts, but it's your job to figure out who you're going to swap with? Or is it the employer's job to figure out how to make that shift swap happen? And where does that sort of line get drawn? And I think Groff helped us draw that line that the employer has an obligation to get involved um, and facilitate the swap. Uh, we long recommended that the employer quantify with their legal counsel sort of what the hardship was before denying it, even if it wasn't dollars and cents make sure you can identify and quantify what the hardship is before you say, I can't do it. We've long recommended that employers look at shift swaps as a potential accommodation. As I said, over time, our advice as to how involved the employer had to be in facilitating the swap, I think has uh, matured, but it certainly now is that the employer has to be involved in facilitating the swap uh, at all times. Um, we've long recommended that employers, especially large employers, be wary of relying exclusively on overtime costs. Now, Groff says, you can't do it. It ain't going to be enough uh, to show hardship just because you have to pay overtime to someone to cover a shift. Um, the other interesting thing I found was that they were asking, the counsel in Groff was asking the Supreme Court to throw out all of the EEOC guidance in this area uh, because it, it allegedly relied on the de minimis test from Hardison. And in fact, the court said, we're not going to throw out all of the EEOC guidance on this. A good deal of the EEOC's guidance in this area is sensible and will in all likelihood be unaffected by the court's clarifying decision. This is SCOTUS speaking, but it would not be prudent to ratify in toto a body of EEOC interpretation that has not had the benefit of the clarification the court adopts today. So Dawn and I were talking about this after the fact, and the EEOC has always been um, much more lenient in terms of employee rights uh, under the religious accommodation standard um, than, for example, some of the early decisions under the de minimis standard. They always required you to engage in the interactive process and to show that there was some cost. Um, and I think the only thing one of the main things that will change is any reference to de minimis. They will, they will take that out and they will look closely at any reference to de minimis or any suggestion that overtime might be a burden or a cost or shift swaps 
aren't required. But frankly, I think the EEOC required employers to do more than just de minimis long before Groff. And here's something that I'm going to go out on a limb about a little bit. I don't think that health and safety issues have changed. That is, health and safety is still an undue hardship. The Groff decision was notably silent. It didn't speak on it, but uh, it didn't speak on health and safety and whether health and safety impacts can be an undue hardship. But I believe, and I think Dawn believes, and I think Darianne believes, that the court left in place the longstanding body of law and EEOC guidance that says that health and safety impacts can be an undue hardship. So you don't have to show dollars and cents. Um, impacts on health and safety of coworkers, patients, clients, customers, the public will often be an undue hardship if quantifiable and provable. And where this has a significant effect is on all these cases we're seeing about reasonable uh, religious accommodation in the hospital mandatory vaccine uh, policy cases. And the, for example, if somebody wants to take um, a break to pray, but they're on a manufacturing line, which will shut down or someone else's productivity or someone else's job will literally have to stop completely as a result of that person taking a break and it may create a health and safety issue then you may actually say it's an undue hardship and you don't have to make it um i think an obvious example but um believe it or not we've had this question somebody who wanted to burn incense in connection with their religious beliefs in a room that had combustible materials, lithium ion batteries and the like, um, you can say, no, we don't have to accommodate your religious request to burn incense in a room with combustibles. Um, the EEOC has come out strongly uh, with respect to health and safety issues that it can be an undue hardship in certain circumstances. And I would suggest this to you. It has always been the case, even in the disability standpoint, in the disability context, that if someone requests um, a, an accommodation for their mental disability, but there is a belief that they could be a danger to themselves or others in the workplace, you have never had to grant that accommodation. So think about that in the context of this. It has always been a substantial cost, even in the ADA context, uh, if someone would pose a health and safety risk to others and you've never had to grant that accommodation. So even though SCOTUS was silent, uh, I think you're still good on the health and safety issue, uh, refusing to accommodate. What has changed also, there's no question in anyone's mind that SCOTUS is signaling a new deference to religious rights. No one is surprised given the makeup of the court, but some courts had been leaning this way anyway, and now the Supreme Court has weighed in clearly. Groff signals that the Supreme Court will be rigorous in scrutinizing undue hardship defenses um, and will be deferential to religious requests for accommodation. Uh, it will be harder to rely on coworker impacts unless you can show that it actually affects business operations or the conduct of the business, as they said. It's even more important now to make thoughtful, considered decisions about undue hardship and um, lay out what that hardship is if you're going to deny a request and work with counsel uh, with specific expertise in this area. Um, I also would suggest that you need to really think about what jurisdiction you're in um, because there are some states that have um, uh, more that scrutinize more and have laws that actually deal with uh, uh, religious accommodation that is that are more careful, for example, than Title VII. The practical effects also that you're going to see more accommodation requests and more litigation. I'm sorry to say it. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is going to embolden the plaintiff's bar, and they're going to throw Groff in your face uh, at every chance. I've already gotten it thrown in my face a couple times. It will increase the trend toward religious requests for accommodation from vaccine requirements. People will try to take Groff and have it apply to health and safety and suggest that SCOTUS's silence on this somehow means, you know, they've blown up uh, uh, 50 years of health and safety litigation. They have not. It will increase the trend toward religious requests for accommodation regarding LGBTQ plus trainings. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but many of us have gotten requests from religious employees to uh, waive or opt out of diversity training sessions that have LGBTQ content in them because they say they don't believe in it and don't want to participate. 
It may also increase the trend toward religious requests for accommodation regarding religious speech that may be offensive toward protected categories. And once again, this is the intersectionality between religious rights in the workplace and LGBTQ rights in the workplace and other uh, protected classes in the workplace. We're seeing more and more and more litigation about folks who are religious who say, I wanna say negative things about LGBTQ people out loud in the workplace, even though it may offend them and employers saying, you know, what are we supposed to do here? How do we accommodate this religious free speech, but also make sure that our LGBTQ employees can come to the workplace uh, and bring their full selves? So I think we're going to see more and more of that um, intersectionality between religious free speech in the workplace uh, and, and requests for accommodation in that regard, as well as uh, LGBT rights. Uh, Don, you want to tell us a little bit about how this might affect pending litigation? Is it going to be retroactive or prospective? Yes, thank you. Um, so we have gotten a lot of questions um, over the last week about this topic um, as to whether there is an effect on cases that are currently pending um, in the courts. Um, we believe that Groff does apply retroactively. Um, and wanted to spend a moment walking through why, why that's our analysis. Um, so Groff is essentially a question of statutory interpretation. It's, it's really looking at the plain meaning of that term undue hardship under Title VII that's been there, of course, you know, all along. Um, and it really looked at the plain meaning of that statutory term. Um, it also noted, as I said earlier, that it was clarifying but not overturning Hardison. Um, and then Groff's substantial cost standard actually comes from language that's within Hardison itself, albeit in a, in a footnote. Um, and so the court is really saying, this is what undue hardship has meant all along. And if some lower courts, and the court doesn't specify which ones, but if some of them kind of strayed away from that plain meeting and interpreted de minimis as just a trifling, then that was erroneous. Um, and it's also worth noting that the Groff court remanded the case, the, that existing case, to the lower courts to apply that substantial cost standard to the specific facts of that pending case. Um, and, and says, you know, having clarified the, the Title VII undue hardship standard, we think it's appropriate to leave the context specific application of that clarified standard to the lower courts in the first instance. Um, and um, that conclusion that Groff um, is presumptively retroactive is also consistent with the legal framework regarding retroactivity. I'm not going to go through all of the cases, but um, suffice it to say that in, in general, um, there is a presumption of retroactivity where the court has not indicated that it's prospective only. Um, and that while statutes are typically prospective, um, legal decisions are typically um, uh, retroactive. And, but you know that doesn't mean the fact that it's it's retroactive does not mean that it has to upend your existing litigation. Um, hopefully, your legal team has anticipated this decision for the last year, as we have. Um, I know in in all of our religious accommodation cases, whether those are vaccine cases or otherwise, um, we have been very attuned to the fact that the um, the minimus standard was um, likely to uh, be out the window. And so we have been very careful in the way that we have briefed um, our cases. And so um, it doesn't have to change the result of your case, but it is something that will apply retroactively. And, and you'll need to think about in your um, pending litigation whether a notice of supplemental authority is warranted. Um, hey, Dawn, can I jump in here? <clears throat> Absolutely. So for those of you who've been patient enough to live with us uh, for the last 45 minutes, you are entitled to a CLE credit. And so the CLE code I'm going to give you right now to write down is SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 8721. SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 8721. Um, and then we will be sending out a form after this uh, to everyone who attended so you can get credit. Sorry, Don, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so we wanted to spend um, some time on kind of practical guidance because I know that, you know, at the end of the day, everyone wants to know, okay, so what do we have to do differently now that Graf has issued? And so that's what we're going to spend some time on. Um, and I see tons of um, excellent questions in the chat. So keep those coming um, and we'll address them to the extent we can as we go, although our time is short. 
Um, the first key takeaway is training. So employers should be immediately training um, any employee who reviews religious accommodations on how to apply this, this new standard. So that's in-house counsel, um, human resources, uh, business partners who may be intersecting with these requests, um, supervisors to the extent that, that they are fielding requests. Um, this is the kind of training that we provide um, all the time to clients. Um, and we recommend that, that, that people do that immediately because the standard has, has obviously shifted um, considerably. Um, and, you know, I, I think as is fairly obvious from, from the new substantial cost standard, um, you know, we need to be immediately uh, making sure that when we're reviewing requests for accommodation um, that, that we are looking at whether we can show that the cost to the business of accommodating a religious request would be excessive or unjustifiable. And if we're relying on impact on other employees, then we want um, to be showing um, how that uh, impact on employees is actually gonna affect the conduct of the business. And always with the sort of frame of reference that the size and resources of the business matters. Um, I see a number of questions in the chat about what, what um, do you look just at the department or the division or the location to look at substantial costs or do you look at the organization more broadly? Um, that's something that has been uh, long a, a subject of litigation and it does depend somewhat on your court. Um, I know when, when Lynn and I try these cases, um, there is usually a plaintiff's lawyer who's trying to bring into evidence you know, the whole entire budget or revenues of the entire global organization. Um, and it's somewhat fact specific as to, um, you know, whether, whether there's an argument that you can try to uh, limit it to a more discrete entity. But I would say in general, to be conservative, you want to be, you, you may well be um, looking at the, the cost of the organization more, more globally. Um, so, you know, questions to ask when you're considering whether something is an undue hardship. How large is the company? What is the financial cost? What health and safety risks are at play? Because those have always been kind of a linchpin of, of undue hardship. Um, what is the business impact? Um, what is the impact on coworkers that will actually affect the conduct of the business? And what is the requested accommodation itself? What is the duration? Um, what exactly is the uh, um, employee asking for? How many employees are seeking the requested accommodation? So these are some of the, the, um, the considerations that you need to be thinking about. Uh, I saw a question in the chat, um, you know, for example, how would you prove that there was a safety issue with loose fitting garb that was gonna be near uh, machinery? That's a great example, kind of question that we get all the time. And I, I would say before Groff and after Groff, you would want to look at how can you quantify and prove that risk? And you almost want to be thinking about if you were in front of a jury in three years, what would you be saying to the jury to prove? Because it's it, undue hardship is an employer's defense. Um, and so you might be looking at, you know, what does the, the manager of that um, of that part of the um, the business say about why, you know, maybe there's experience um at the company with issues maybe there have been injuries and so you want to look at how many of them and and what did that look like you might look at are there regulations osha regulations or other regulations that require um no loose fitting attire is there manufacturer guide um, for the particular piece of equipment that says you have to be wary of loose fitting clothing um, and, and so trying to kind of pull that together right up front to, to look at what is the what is the evidence that that is an undue hardship in the context of the business. And Don, let me just jump in there because that question about the loose fitting clothing really lends itself to the first issue, which is you really need to engage in the interactive process. Um, Don's about to talk about sort of some of the questions that we give to employers to use during the interactive process, but when, before you ever make any decision that something is or is not an undue hardship, you need to engage in the interactive process. That has always been the case. And by that, I mean, you need to talk to the person who's requesting the accommodation to get a sense of, is there an easy fix to this? Is there a way to accommodate this person with loose fitting clothing in a way that would still maintain the rules and regulations and OSHA safety standards? Can they work on a different machine that isn't impacted by the loose fitting clothing issue? Can they 
wear clothing that is not quite as loose fitting, but comply with their own religious garb requirements. Trying to work with someone and later showing an agency or a judge or a jury that you engaged in the interactive process, asked questions to see how you could work around and effectuate an accommodation before you decide you can't is absolutely imperative. It was before Groff and it is now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what we like to do is um, we frequently will provide clients with talking points to guide that interactive process because it's a it's a tricky business. Um, it's very important to be respectful. It's important to gather a lot of information in a respectful way. It's important to keep an open mind and ask the employee for their contributions and their kind of brainstorming about what might work. Um, and so we find that talking points are often a good way for um, the person who's conducting the interactive process to make sure that they're within the legal framework and they can kind of stick to those talking points. And then I always tell clients, it's fine to say, thank you so much for this information. We are going to take this under advisement. We will be back to you promptly. You don't need to make an immediate determination so you can think about it and talk about it with your um, counsel. And you may need to go back to the employee for further questions too, because it, it is a, a, a back and forth. Um, we also can help you customize a religious accommodation request form. Um, I know a lot of clients like to, um, while you can't require the request to be in writing because um, any request, even if it's informal, verbal, has to, that's a request and you have to engage in the interactive process. But some clients like to use the accommodation request form because it, it um, sort of requires the employee to document um, some specifics right up front. Um, I know in the COVID vaccine space, a lot of employers um, used these written request forms and are now kind of adapting them to a more general um, religious accommodation framework. And so this is just a sample of um, actually a recent set of talking points that um, that we sent to a client around a Sabbath observance. Um, and, you know, I won't, I won't go through it all, but, you know, basically just saying we, we understand that this is the nature of your request. We're committed to providing reasonable accommodations for sincere religious beliefs if we can without undue hardship. I need a little more information. Can you tell me more about your religious observance, about what it is that you're actually asking for, um, and, and then taking it from there based on, on what the employee says? Um, you know, likely examples of undue hardship. So a lot of questions in the chat around what does substantial costs actually mean under Groff? Mm -hmm. um, and what does it mean um, that, you know, coworker impacts affect the conduct of the business? Um, obviously, we're going to need to see if the EEOC issues um, new guidance and, and see how the case law develops. But in our judgment, based on experience, we believe that um, health and safety impacts absolutely will continue to be substantial costs. Um, the court does not want to be in the position of putting um, people's health and safety at risk, whether that's coworkers, patients, clients, vendors, um, the public. Um, and so that is going to going to remain certainly um, an undue hardship in our judgment. Um, we do not believe that um, courts will require the hiring of a new employee to do the job of the person requesting the accommodation. That has always been kind of a bridge too far in the accommodation space, and we think it um, will continue to be. Um, one question that's come up in the last week is, um, do you have to pay an employee not to work? Um, so can you require employees, if they've used up their, their um, paid time off and their vacation time, um, do you have to pay them for times that they're not at work, maybe observing a religious holiday. Our judgment is that courts are unlikely to require that under this new substantial costs um, standard. Also, permitting an employee to be disrespectful or discriminatory toward others in the workplace. Um, you know, we are seeing the divisions from society in general come more and more into the workplace. Um, and so there can be sort of tricky aspects of of helping people to um, get along when they have various viewpoints, but we do not believe that um, an employer will be required to sort of put up with someone who is being discriminatory or disrespectful to, to colleagues, uh, regardless of religious beliefs. And then I think Lynn is just gonna walk through some, some real life scenarios in our final moments. Yeah, I also wanted to say that um, what you have not heard us talk about is that first part of the Title VII test. You know, you have to, an employee has to show they have a sincere religious belief before you get to that undue hardship test. Um, and the reason that we haven't covered that is that nobody will. Often uh, employers come to me and, said, and say, um, 
I don't think she's sincere when she says she needs to observe the Sabbath, or I don't think it's a real religion, i.e. the church of body modification. Um, and the one thing I think that shocked me over the last 25 years is that courts will refuse to wade into that area of what is and is not a valid religion. Um, they won't touch it. And so to the extent you don't want to uh, grant the accommodation, it ought to be on the grounds that Groff sets out. That is, that there is a substantial cost to not accommodating this person. Not that you don't believe that they're sincere or that you don't recognize whatever religion it is that they are uh, trying to get accommodated for. It is, for whatever reason, uh, not a place that judges will wade into and not a place where you're going to see much law because people take uh, employees at their word when they say they aren't sincere or they say they have religious beliefs generally. Um, there are certainly exceptions, but generally I would not uh, put my money on that. So um, just in, a, in the final few minutes to wrap up, there have been a couple questions about um, collective bargaining agreements and seniority systems, like what do you do about unions? Um, and what do you do if employers have seniority systems and someone asks to take the Sabbath off even though they're not senior enough. Um, so here's what our labor partners have done some thinking about. In a unionized workplace, employers with seniority systems should consider the facts in a specific bidding system. Um, if the bidding system is not truly seniority based, such that the Title VII protections don't attach, don't worry about it. Is the employee senior enough to bid another shift to accommodate their religious needs? Start there first. Ask, is it possible for the employee to trade shifts with another employee? Is it possible for the employer to leave the shift short-staffed uh, and still not affect the conduct of the business? Is it possible for the employer to incentivize other employees to pick up that employee's shift? Uh, and in the unionized employers, they would just be careful to avoid running afoul of the collective bargaining agreement or other labor laws. And is there any other way to get the shift covered without the employee? If the answer to any of these questions is yes, then um, the employer, the unionized employer, cannot rely on de minimis costs and should never have been relying on that and should show that there is an undue hardship. Uh, there would be substantial increased costs. So I think it's going to be easier in a unionized workplace to show cost when you can point to the collective bargaining agreement because that arguably would affect the conduct of your workplace. It is a contract that governs everyone's employment. And if you can't comply due to the strictures of the contract, that will likely be an argument uh, for not accommodating. Um, so it may be a little bit easier in a unionized workforce if the answer to any of those questions is yes. Um, but I still think you need to go through all of those questions before you can decide you can't accommodate. Dawn, do you have anything to add? No, I think that covers it. I think we're almost at time. Um, we talked a little bit about, we're almost out of time, but we talked a little bit about sort of this issue of, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, religious employees saying they don't want to attend diversity uh, and employment and inclusion trainings. Uh, they don't want to engage in any non-discrimination programs or trainings because they don't believe in LGBTQ rights uh, and inclusion, and therefore they shouldn't be required to participate. Um, I would say currently it's unclear whether an accommodation needs to be provided to an employee who objects, but we continue to, and until we are corrected, will continue to, make the strong argument that such programs are core to the business and its values, and that there would be practical cost to exempting an employee from such a training, including harm to coworkers, potential liability risks, um, et cetera. And so I think, and we continue to advise, that it is an undue hardship uh, to grant an accommodation to a religious employee who does not want to attend diversity and employment trainings. I'm sure we will be challenged soon and we'll get the answer, but we continue to advise that you can deny those requests for accommodation. Dawn, Darianne, do you disagree with that? No, that's absolutely what, what we're still advising clients. Darianne, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, no, I don't disagree with anything. All right, good. So um, with that said, I just want to add one more caveat that I said at the beginning, and I'm going to remind you at the end. We've been talking mostly about Title VII. We threw in a couple of local jurisdictions, but I think you need to be aware that many states and some localities have specialized statutes regarding religious accommodation, many of which have always been 
um, more strict with respect to employers being able to claim undue hardship and requiring employers to grant religious accommodations more often. Uh, Massachusetts, for example, which may surprise some of you, has a statute that requires employers to provide a Sabbath day of rest for any employee that asks for it. There's no like, you know, do the interactive process, see if it's an undue hardship. The statute just says when they ask for it, you have to give it to them. Uh, California also has a unique state law regarding undue hardship, um, which is a little bit more strict. So there are many other state statutes. And for those of you who would like uh, a list of those, we're gathering them, we have them. Um, but just know where you are, pay attention to your jurisdiction. As I set out in the, at the beginning, the First Circuit always had a much more um, loose de minimis standard for employers than the Second Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit. So be aware of where you are um, as well. With that said, I think we are at our time and we're very grateful for everyone uh, who attended. If you have questions, we're going to try to get back to the folks that ask questions in the chat individually, but here is our contact information for those of you who have questions. And I think we're going to hand out the PowerPoint and you will also be able to watch a video of this if you didn't get to see it the first time. Make Christina? sense? Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending.